and we are recording now. So this session will be on our Moodle platform um, under our PEDEX session, uh, our PEDEX course uh, on Moodle. So if you have any questions about that, you can uh, get in touch with me or Michelle Widener here at Envision, and we'll help you out with that. So if you would like a CME CEU or an attendance certificate, uh, we do just need you to either chat to us and let us know that you're out there and where you're from, or you can unmute here in just a minute, and uh, we'll have an opportunity to do that. So you can introduce yourselves. Uh, computer video and audio, um, those are the little icons. Typically, they're on the bottom left of your screen. You can mute those or stop them if you would like. Uh, we would love to have you on camera and uh, be able to also talk with you. So if, uh, if that's all right with you, go ahead and unmute and say hi to us. Here's our disclosure and accreditation statements. We're required to put those on screen in order to give out our CME. Hello. All right, we'll move on. Um, so now's our opportunity for roll call. So um, if you are on audio, go ahead and say who you are and where you're from. Otherwise, we would love uh, for you to use the chat box. Hi, Stephanie Nevarez Fernandez from First Choice Community Health. Hi, Melissa. Hi. Good afternoon. Who else do we have? Richard Stam from uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'm a retired pediatrician. Good afternoon. Jolie Amir from Tohatchee. Hello. And we also have Jane Beckley on. And let's see, we might have, oh, Stephanie Noya, one moment. Just promoting you now. All right, I think that's all I had. And we'll go ahead and hand it over. All right. Um, well, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I do want to just mention before I introduce okay. our wonderful speaker that if you all have any suggestions or recommendations for topics that you would like us to cover on the PEDEX Talks, to please email me. Uh, it is Melissa E. Mason, M-E-L-I-S-S-A-E-M-A-S-O-N at gmail.com, and I will do my very best to get those topics covered. So thanks again for joining us. Um, and now it is really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ann Green. She's the Director of Electrophysiology and Cardiac Exercise Testing at UNM. Um, she sees a lot of patients with syncope, so she's an ideal person to speak on this topic today. She is professor of pediatrics and is back to Albuquerque uh, in 2015 from Washington, D.C. Um, she was a cardiology fellowship director there, and she is the vice chair of pediatrics for education. So please help me welcome um, Dr. Ann Green. Uh, hi, everybody. It's nice to see people I've spoken to on the phone, um, in person, kind of. Uh, and uh, my goal is to talk a little bit about um, syncope, obviously, and uh, the most common causes. And then I have a few cases to go through. So what I thought I would do is at the end of each case stop and see if there's any questions so we can sort of go through uh, one thing at a time. But if there's any burning questions, please send a chat and let us know. And then we'll stop and make sure everybody is, um, you know, able to move along. So syncope is really common. Um, before I did cardiology, I was a pediatric emergency medicine doctor for many years. And not a day went by that I didn't see at least two or three uh, patients with syncope. So um, it's really common. And even though we will talk about some of the more rare reasons and things to keep in mind when you're speaking to people, um, I think this is something that's well within the scope of pediatricians, family physicians, and emergency physicians. Um, and really, I just want to give people kind of a checklist in your mind for things to think about that maybe uh, those few patients would need further workup, but I, I do think most of the time this is something that's um, in the bailiwick of uh, people in primary care. Um, so then the other thing you want to do is just identify the patients with syncope who actually are at increased risk of um, something bad like uh, ventricular arrhythmia or sudden death. So it's really all about risk assessment, and when we think about symptomatic patients who are presenting with syncope, 
Um, we want to make sure that it's just that, so to speak. Um, and if there are concomitant symptoms of chest pain or palpitations uh, or things that make you feel like it's something out of the ordinary, then those are the ones that we worry about. Um, vasovagal syncope is really common. Uh, probably everybody has had this who's gone through med school uh, um, at some point of our first OR experience or something like that, you know. Um, and it's kind of a fascinating topic, really, because there's a lot of inputs that can cause it. So we know standing for a long time. Um, I find that somehow religious ceremonies bring this out. Uh, and I don't know if it's the sort of content material that's being discussed uh, or the packed in uh, or wearing robes of some kind or having to perform. Um, but I've seen lots of kids who have passed out when they're in church or temple or uh, things of that nature, choir practice, um, all those kinds of things. Um, and a lot of that, will I'll, I'll talk a bit of why that happens, but usually the history is everything. And if somebody is nauseated and has some gradual vision changes, they protect themselves as they go down, they may have some hearing thing, and, you know, that's all pretty reassuring uh, for vasovagal, even though still want to do our checklist to make sure it's not something more dangerous. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, kids have this with immunizations. That's probably a combination of fear and also some pain, sight of blood, uh, or anything that's really surprising. Um, but then there's some funny ones like hairbrush syncope, uh, where traction on uh, hair actually, um, big, huge rollers um, or really brushing hair hard, uh, especially if you have your head over and you're brushing your hair really hard, things like that. Um, will sometimes cause uh, syncope and just pain, especially if it's surprising. So you all of a sudden get hit, you know, in your funny bone when you're playing basketball. That kind of a pain stimulus is more likely to cause syncope than something that you're anticipating. Uh, and then orthostatic symptoms uh, oftentimes play into it. There's usually a mixture of a uh, sort of perfect storm that causes someone to actually lose consciousness. So standing for a long time, hot shower, hot weather, any of those things will cause you to have pooling up blood in your lower extremities and lower your blood pressure, which you can tolerate as long as you're also not dehydrated or you also didn't lower your heart rate because you had a big basal response or you weren't on a medicine that didn't allow you uh, to basal constrict, things like that. Um, and that can happen after exercise when you're vasodilated, but that starts to get into that two symptom thing where now you're exercising and having syncope and you know, that's where you have to really convince yourself harder that it's something benign and maybe needs more workup. So again, it's all in the history and vasovagal or orthostatic is the most common and then we're gonna talk about some of the more rare ones. Syncope with exercise, chest pain or palpitations, um, now you've hit like two or three, so that one needs more um, workup. Somebody who's had cardiac surgery in the past or a procedure or something like that is a red flag. And of course, if it's really sudden and they have no warning and they actually get injured, that always is one of those um, situations where you need some more workup. And sometimes when we get the history the third or fourth time and all the details kind of sorted out, I've had patients who actually tripped over something and fell and hurt themselves, and that was the actual mechanism. But at first blush, it seemed like they went down suddenly. So that's one of those danger signs. And then the other huge piece of history is family history. Um, and that's not something that you can always get completely in the emergency department or even in a uh, urgent care visit. Uh, I've definitely had families where I didn't get the whole history for maybe three or four visits. Um, it may have taken me a whole year to get all of that history and really figure out the risk. So it's not something easy to do, but it's one of those things that um, also is amenable to a questionnaire type of thing in uh, people's offices. And um, American Academy has some very good questionnaires that people can just download to use for family history for red flags there. But we're looking for inheritable causes of sudden death. Um, or history of that uh, in a family, suspicious accidents, one car accidents, uh, seizures can be a masquerade for arrhythmias that, um, you know, have gone on for generations and not really been figured out. And of course, somebody who has a pacemaker or family member with a defibrillator um, are ones that would pop up at you, um, but you need to ask because not everybody will tell you that instantly. 
Um, and then for long QT syndrome, drowning and congenital deafness definitely go along with type 1. And then I always ask, after I ask all of those questions, and a lot of people don't like to answer those, um, it's kind of jarring to ask those questions. So I, the way I do it is I just ask if there were people who passed away at an early age. I try not to use the word death too much because I think it, it scares everybody and they can't even remember uh, very well. So I ask about funny episodes or anything that happened to a distant relative that didn't make sense um, and just sort of, you know, get around to some of the, what I call creepier questions, um, which I tell them now I'm going to ask you some creepy questions just to, you know, let people keep thinking about it. Uh, so. We'll start with a couple of cases. Um, this is case one, 12 year old boy standing on the risers during a choral performance. Um, it, this is kind of uh, loaded with pretty obvious clues. Uh, he was wedged in by other students. He felt very hot, he got sweaty, he felt nauseated. Then he couldn't hear the music. He saw splash before his eyes and he fell over on everybody else. So that's kind of a typical um, Disney version in a way of uh, a vasovagal type event and his family history is completely negative. So we're pretty confident that he's not gonna have something dangerous, but we'll ask all those family history questions anyway. Um, so he is uh, somebody who has vasodepressor syncope, neurocardiogenic syncope, simple fainting, they all mean the same thing. And it all revolves around this thing called the basal gerish reflex, um, which uh, looks kind of complicated, but the bottom line is you inappropriately vasodilate, and then if you're really unlucky, you inappropriately lower your heart rate, and the combination of the two are gonna make you pass out. And the way I explain this to my patients is that they uh, don't really have quite enough blood volume for whatever reason. They're a little dehydrated or they vasodilated. And because of that, their heart, when it squeezes, uh, sends some signals up to the brain that causes them to think that they're hypertensive, which is great if you're older and you actually have hypertension, but if you're younger and skinny and tall, it doesn't really help you too much. And so because of that, these C fibers make a mistake in a way, and the brain starts doing all kinds of stuff to lower your blood pressure. Withdraw sympathetic tone and you vasodilate more. And if you get vagal efferents involved, then you'll get a decreased heart rate. That'll be more the vasovagal type. If you don't get that happening, that'll be more the orthostatic intolerance type. But it all sort of funnels into not enough blood volume. And, you know, actually kids, it, it takes me a couple of visits usually to kind of really uh, explain this. And once they understand it, I've seen them manage it pretty well themselves. So I'm going to throw some EKGs in because I can't resist, of course, um, since that's what I do for a living. And pretty much... Other than the kids that obviously were dehydrated, I don't think they all need an EKG, but any of them that have a question pretty much end up getting one. So I'm gonna show you examples as we go through of what the EKG would look like in each of these scenarios. So this is just somebody with sinus bradycardia, the rate's 55, um, the QT's normal, uh, the PR interval is okay, I don't see any pre-excitation. So this is just a normal ECG, but that makes me think that there's kind of increased vagal tone with that patient, so it kind of, you know, fits in my mind of vasovagal. And then, of course, if you get a history of lying to standing, uh, positional type changes that are orthostatic, that's pretty good for dehydration or maybe a medication. Post-viral illness, um, a lot of patients will have some autonomic dysfunction, I think, so sort of the way we used to think of the kids with mono had to stay home for a couple of months because they just didn't feel good. I think post a lot of viral infections is when I see a lot of this kind of persistent orthostatic type of thing, um, and they may get it with exercise. But just to bring out one other little thing that isn't life-threatening, but is another position change kind of deal. So anything that um, position changes affect the, the AV node because it's a vagal stimulus. And there are some forms of SVT that actually can get brought out by a vagal stimulus and also get converted by a vagal stimulus. So just keep that in the back of your mind that um, when you ask about that, just make sure they don't remember that they actually had palpitations just before they passed out too. So that's a, a little caveat. Not, not so much about the detail here, but this uh, type of SVT is kind of a little re circuit in the AV node and it's sensitive to vagal stimulus, so it can actually stop and start. So when I ask patients about that, 
you know, if they bend over and tie their shoe and they go into a fast rhythm, and then they stand up and move their head in a different direction and it goes away, I'm suspicious that it's that sort of SVT. Again, not life-threatening, but um, if you get that history, that's really helpful because then, you know, that's something that uh, we can help with that. So again, history, history, history. Basal-vagal episodes have a prodrome, and usually it's nausea, hot, vision changes, um, and things like that. Um, oftentimes when I see patients for this, I do a little 10-minute bedside orthostatic um, vital signs to see whether or not their heart rate goes up or down. Um, I almost never do formal tilt testing because I don't really think I get much more information out of that. Um, the kids hate it. Um, and you get a lot of false positives. You can make almost anybody pass out with those, and I'm looking for a little more sensitive type of response. Um, usually the people that are really orthostatic um, have more dizziness than syncope, uh, and again, oftentimes after an illness of some sort. And the treatment for both of them is the same, and this is something that um, you know pediatricians do all the time, and I'm grateful for that, and want to make people feel comfortable that that's perfectly the right way to go. Um, you know, hydration first, so you need to fill up their, their blood volume. Um, salt helps them hang on to water, obviously. And so for an adolescent, they need to drink at least four bottles of water a day. And in our climate, probably a little more. And I'm talking the 16 ounce bottles. Um, sometimes adding Florinef, which I'm sure you've had patients on that, is helpful, but I frankly don't really like giving those adrenal steroids if I don't have to, and it doesn't work unless they're already doing great hydration and salt. And so I focus a lot on talking about it and a lot of patient education um, the first time I see people and talk about that. Now, if it's the chronic orthostatic intolerance patients who sometimes get called POTS, which you may have heard of that diagnosis, um, I try not to use that phrase. I more likely call it orthostatic intolerance, but it's the folks that have that kind of chronicity. Um, they really need uh, a whole four-pronged approach in a way, I would say. They need to get tone back up in their lower extremities because they usually gotten really deconditioned and um, a recumbent bike or anything they can use like that to get the muscle tone back up in their legs is really important. Sometimes I can talk uh, girls into wearing support stockings, but not usually. Um, if it is a girl and she has bad menstrual cycles, suppressing that is very helpful. Um, and I have you know, them see their primary doctors or GYN or however that needs to be handled. If they have a chronic pain issue, migraines are often mixed in with this. Um, dealing with that's really key too because you can't really get them to drink enough and it's a vicious cycle. Um, and then a lot of times, and I offer all of this, I go through this whole big regimen with the families when I see them. A lot of times they're um, terrified and have some sort of uh, PTSD from it um, that uh, cognitive therapy can be helpful too. So we have a, no, we have a question, and that is, um, how much salt do you recommend they get? Oh, that's a good question. Um, most of the time I have them just eat a lot of salty food. So if they want to eat like, um, you know, soups that have a lot of salt in it or ramen noodles or things like that, um, if they do a couple of, soy sauce is a fantastic salt. Um, as you know, like none of our rooms fit the next day if we eat a lot of that. Um, and a lot of them, that's more palatable. So two or three times a day, I ask them to eat something really salty like that, have pretzels in their bag, um, things like that. Um, some kids don't like to do that and they want to take salt tablets. Um, they're actually not prescription. They're, uh, and you almost have to order them online. So there's thermotabs. Um, and I usually just start with one a day and see if they tolerate it because it can upset their stomach um, and maybe a couple. And I find that plus a lot of water is, you know, um, so I don't really overdo the salt too much. Um, but a lot of times kids won't eat salty food. And, and what the truth is, usually they're not eating very much salt at all because we've all gotten healthy about how we cook. Uh, and so they're thrilled that they get to eat, you know, some of the salty stuff that everyone else in the family can't eat. Um, okay, so that's the most common stuff and um, is the huge bulk of it. I'd say at least 80% of kids who pass out are going to have either a vasovagal or some orthostatic type symptom. Um, and then now we're going to talk about kind of the more rare ones to keep in the back of your mind that you're running your checklist um, just to make sure it doesn't sound like it's one of those. So we want to recognize risk factors. Um, 
before events, that's great if you happen to have a family history type questionnaire. But for sure, we want to recognize significant symptoms and then figure out who needs more diagnostic testing and, and consultation. So if you look, now we're talking about, we've moved from syncope for a minute to the actual tragedy of sudden death and what does that really mean in our country. Um, there's data from, uh, I'll talk a little bit about Australia in a second too, but if you look at the range there, it's gigantic. So nobody's really sure how many of these happen a year, although a good friend of mine has actually started a registry at NIH now to um, keep track of that, but it's probably somewhere between 500 and 1,000 a year. And when you look back, a lot of them had previous symptoms. Um, probably a lot of those were benign sounding, so it's hard to know in retrospect um, if you would have picked it up. And then many of them will have something um, on, autopsy, on autopsy, especially now that we can do genetic um, autopsies. And then if you look at a kind of controlled population in Australia, um, I just want to point out if it's cardiac, and as you can see, there's quite a few, almost half were not cardiac, although I was wondering about the epilepsy part, if that some arrhythmia patients are hiding in there. Um, but in and amongst the sudden death patients in that population, a lot of them are arrhythmias or myocarditis. Um, and if you look at... Um, I'll show you a slide in a second, but the American data is a little different. So if you just now go with athletes, so now we're even at a more narrow definition, half of those are going to be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, who die like playing sports, and 25% are going to be coronary anomalies. But again, remember, this isn't the syncope patients. This is the ones that actually had terrible events, which, of course, we're hoping you know we'll discover before that happens. So what are the things we're actually looking for? What's our secret checklist? Um, I call it my invisible clipboard. Um, and I write stuff on it, and then I, um, I don't rest until I've crossed out um, what's over there. So hereditary channelopathy like long QT syndrome, Brugada, the kind of stuff that I um, deal with a lot. Um, that's certainly somebody that we hope we can pick up um, with their sentinel event of syncope. Um, somebody with WPW, um, if they passed out, that would be something easy to find. Cardiomyopathy, again, I mentioned coronary anomalies, the late post-op arrhythmias, congenital AV block, and then structural things like um, um, outflow tract destruction. And there's different clues for each of these that we'll talk about. And some are history, some are family history, some are physical exam, and some are what would you look at at a screening EKG. It's kind of how I separate it. So initial cardiac workup for syncope, again, it's uh, what I call forensic um, you know, medicine. I, I, I love mysteries and, and murder mysteries, so I think this sort of appeals to my detective side. Um, and so personal history, um, I really try and have somebody um, you know, go back to the event, and I ask them what they were doing just before and how they felt and see if they can describe it to me. Because sometimes you'll get some really good details. They, they forgot they choked when they were drinking soda weird or something like that, you know, and it's just been passed along now as syncope and maybe it wasn't. So I really want to hear the details of the event and then I want to get as much family history as I possibly can. And again, sometimes that takes a while. And of course the obvious things in family history are like someone had sudden death, somebody's got a defibrillator, there are people who drowned and it doesn't sound like it was just an accident, um, early death, things like that. Uh, and again, if it's associated with other symptoms, I worry more. So chest pain with syncope, um, that makes me worry about outflow tract obstruction, coronary artery issues, and those are not going to be something you can figure out by just, for example, listening um, with a stethoscope. Palpitations with syncope, I'm going to worry about an arrhythmia. And if all three of them happen together, then they get the big prize and um, we really need to work them up. So when you think about physical exam, um, thinking about what we're really looking for on the physical, we're looking for anything that gives us a sense that there is not enough flow in particular, um, and LV outflow tract obstruction is kind of the classic one. So you're really listening for a systolic murmur, um, uh, sort of on the left side of the sternum and radiating up towards the right side of the neck, all along that LVOT. But that's where you really want to listen for murmurs. Cyanosis and clubbing would jump out at you. Um, signs of cardiomegaly, you might feel the PMI shifted way over to the left. That might make you worry more about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Weird pulses that are bounding or weak might make you wonder about um, outflow tract obstruction or valve insufficiency. 
And then I can't tell you how many times um, I've come to see somebody and they actually had a scar on their chest and pointedly no one had said, have you ever had heart surgery? You don't think you have to ask these questions, but it's kind of amazing. And some of the scars look so great now um, with subcuticular sutures and maybe if somebody doesn't make any keloid, you, you might not see it. So again, we all look at the chest, but that's what you're looking at. And then if you do an EKG, these are the things we're looking for um, when we first glance at it. So definitely want to be able to look at something and see whether it looks like WPW, and I'll show you one of those in a minute. Coronary artery anomalies, really you're looking for ischemia there, because without that you wouldn't necessarily see something. And those heritable um, genetic arrhythmia stuff that um, I can talk about forever that are fascinating to me, um, there's a list of the ones that we're looking at, like long QT, Brugada, and some other weirder ones um, that are ventricular tachycardia syndromes. Okay, so here's a 10-year-old who had dizziness during a soccer match yesterday, comes to the office, um, initially felt okay, and then doesn't feel too great after he's being triaged, and um, you did an EKG, and you got this. So if you saw, I, and I'm putting in, I hope, kind of obvious examples, not like trying to trick anybody, um, and uh, when you look at it, you can see it's really fast. It's like 280 or something. So it's there's no doubt in anybody's mind that uh, this is um, uh, not just like a sinus tachycardia. And um, so this is a nice, skinny, narrow, complex SVT um, in a 10-year-old. And um, we don't know if it's WPW or not, but we know they have the, it's SVT. And, you know, if they go right out of it, um, hopefully we got a tracing of it and so that I can kind of help with that. But say they go to the ER or they're in the ER, or urgent care and they get some adenosine, which as everybody remembers, blocks the AV node for a couple of nanoseconds. Um, and now we have this really weird looking EKG. So for this, this patient to go to this EKG means that we just um, put them back in sinus rhythm, but they have WPW. So here's a wide QRS and a really short PR interval. And it's really strange looking. The T waves look weird because if you have abnormal depolarization, you'll have an abnormal repolarization. You might look at that and say to yourself, is this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Is what's wrong with this T wave? And is it a bundle branch? But if you look and see how really short that PR interval is, that's the trick to figuring out that it's actually WPW. Does anybody um, need me to point that out better? Does everybody see that okay? You can nod if you want. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and so why does that happen? Well, when you're hanging out in sinus rhythm, you're conducting down your normal conducting system. This is your AV node and your sinus nodes up here. And you're conducting down the accessory pathway. So a little blob of myocardium over here is getting pre-excited, we say. And so it's making that wide complex because it starts early. So that's the trick with this. This QRS is starting early. It's not a conduction defect where it would start late. When you have a normal PR interval, it's starting early. And you know, if you made that diagnosis, then that's great. You know, then you can give one of us a call and we can we can help figure out what needs to happen after that. But the big deal with WPW is there is in the fine print at the bottom of anything you look up, there's this tiny little risk of sudden death. And it's actually not from uh, SVT, which could be really fast and maybe make you pass out and maybe make it dangerous if you're driving, for example. Um, it's actually a super rare thing where if you have some icky atrial fibrillation up here and a pathway that's willing to conduct really fast, then you can get into some trouble with ventricular arrhythmia. That's the cause of sudden death in WPW, not really fast SVT. So why would a kid get atrial fibrillation? First time they drink a lot, um, they are um, vulnerable to getting atrial fibrillation. So, um, and you know, it doesn't take much, six or seven beers and you've never seen it before. Um, and I've seen that where they'll, they'll have atrial fibrillation and conduct really fast. So again, that's what the, this is the benefit of a screening EKG. Maybe they didn't show up with obvious SVT, but you got one and you see WPW and then we'll backtrack and think to ourselves that was really uh, SVT. 
this I just wanted to show you. This is horrible looking, and you probably are starting to feel vagal looking at it. Um, the nausea, hot, to, you know, feel you need air in the room. Um, this is this is the sudden death rhythm, not the SVT one I showed you before. This is wide, it's fast, it's ugly, but it's very irregular. You see how the art hour intervals are very different. So this is actually horrible atrial fibrillation conducting down that pathway that somehow was able to conduct it fast. That's that's the very rare, but that's the risk of sudden death with OEP. We risk stratify these patients by um, exercising them and doing holders to see if that um, uh, pre-excitation is intermittent because that is a little less dangerous. And once they get old enough that they're teenagers, we offer them ablation just to get rid of it so that they don't have to worry. Okay, anybody have a question about that before I move on to a different thing? Okay, and feel free to put some chat um, questions down as we go if you're still thinking about it. Okay, so case three. So this is a 17-year-old who's running in gym class during a warm-up for wrestling practice. He falls onto the mat and he's unresponsive for a couple minutes. So already that's a red flag. This happened with exercise. Um, it seemed like there wasn't a lot of warning, although it's hard to tell. And he's unconscious for uh, a minute or two. Um, this patient would probably go to the ER and get an EKG. That would be kind of routine, I would say. And I just wanted to show you, see how bizarre his EKG looks. So it's sinus rhythm, there's a normal PR interval. I'll tell you right now the QT interval is okay. Um, for him, he's got bizarre looking T waves. And you know, if, if you see something that looks like that, um, I totally respect um, anybody calling me and saying, um, it really looks weird. I mean, that's a very respectable thing to say in my mind <laughs> because it's hard to describe. What, how would you call this? Inverted? Is it biphasic? Um, they're just bizarre. And um, they're inverted over here too, which isn't always abnormal. Big voltages. That's enough with that history. Um, and even just the history by itself would be enough for a workup, but that's the kind of thing that I'd be looking for. Um, this is another patient with some strange looking. Um, T waves with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So again, exercise and syncope together. This is what I'm worried about is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, basketball tends to be the most dangerous with football not far behind our patients with that. And if we do do an echo on them, you'll see this is a um, parasternal long axis view and this is a short axis view sort of looking cross section across the ventricle. This is the normal one. Nice. Um, skinny septum, aortic valve, mitral valve, left atrium, left ventricle, and here we're looking at the left ventricle and the right ventricle right above it, and there's your septum. Um, here's somebody with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, really thick, so you can just picture as the heart squeezes that not much blood's gonna get out there. And then look at this gigantic septum that your coronary arteries have to try and perfuse inadequately most of the time, but with exercise, it's gonna be even worse. So again, athlete, syncope together um, with exercise. There's a bunch of things we're worried about, but this is number one. Um, and in the American data, um, if you look at the athletes who um, die suddenly, half of them are, are um, cardiomyopathy. And about 20%, 25% are coronary artery anomalies and then some other uh, various things. So that's what we're worried about. So as you walk into the room and you see somebody who's got this complaint of they passed out with exercise, you know, you're really focusing in your mind on, um, do I hear anything that sounds like uh, outflow tract obstruction? You know, do I hear any murmurs that are along that um, aortic uh, tract? Uh, and again, syncope with exercise, murmur, um, we might see LVH on the ECG. And we might get a family history for this. It's autosomal dominant. So it usually there is one parent, unless it's a new mutation, that will have it. Um, and as you go back through the family tree, it's really hard to tell because it's progressive. It's not seen in little children and not everybody gets the same phenotype. So there could certainly be people with it who never had symptoms, um, but that's the genetics of it. So syncope or presyncope is definitely a risk factor for um, sudden death in those patients. Um, and again, just the pearl of that is exercise and syncope together. Um, that's the big thing to worry about. 
So here's a good example of the history holding um, the most important information. Um, this is a 14-year-old who had syncope. She's on many psychiatric medications. Um, this was not with exercise, and it actually had some vasovagal components to the history and some orthostatic components, but we had this family history of an aunt who had died early. Um, then we got an EKG on her, and her QTC was really long, like way over 500, and um, the decision was made to stop all her meds and see whether or not that was enough to lower her QTC back to normal. So normal QT for um, prepubertal kids is about 440, in case that was a question. Um, girls who are post-puberty um, can go up into the mid 450 range, and boys in the mid 440 range is fine. EKG machines are awful at um, A, calculating, and B, telling you whether or not it's prolonged or not, because You'll see one that comes out 500 and the machine doesn't say anything. And you'll see one that comes out 444 and it'll say borderline QT. So, um, you know, I teach the residents a lot about how to measure it, but those are kind of the ranges you're looking at. So you could say, well, it kind of got back in normal range, but that's not normal. And even if it's just with medication, that's still too long. So in my mind, this was already long QT, but um, people kind of wanted to figure that out. Um, this is her initial um, ECG, and you see how long and drawn out her QT is. Okay. Um, I got additional history. This, this took a long time to get this history, but eventually I got history that the mother, maternal grandmother, and maternal great-grandmother, and maternal aunt all had had events. And they all were related to loud noises during sleep. One was an earthquake. One was um, a phone call in the middle of the night. One was a baby screaming in the middle of the night. Um, and so symptoms like that in sleep, waking you up suddenly, tends to be type 2 long QT syndrome, which um, is, uh, is a potassium channel defect just like type 1, but it tends to happen in your sleep. So the way I think of this is type 1s are the congenital deafness um, drowning, um, and with exercise um, type events. It's the most common, and that one's not too hard to figure out even if the genetics are negative because they have very abnormal stress tests. So I do a lot of stress tests to look for that in patients with borderline um, QT. Type 2, um, I kind of call these folks the alarm clock people. So they're sleeping quietly with a nice low heart rate. They get a big um, catecholamine surge, and that causes them to have a bad rhythm, and that's what that whole family had. And then type 3 is a totally different um, um, mutation. It's sodium channel mutation. They tend to just die in their sleep because they get bradycardic and get an arrhythmia. So these people are unlikely to show up with syncope. That's not how they present, but type 1 and 2 may. Um, and that's just sort of a little summary there of those three types. Uh, remember, meds can prolong your QT, um, and some meds um, attack your sodium potassium channels, like antiarrhythmic drugs, like sodalol and amiodarone, that you know you would never um, prescribe, but you might have some patients who are on it. Um, but some really common stuff like antiemetics, antibiotics and a whole bunch of psychiatric meds all can prolong the QT. So if somebody's in your practice who has long QT syndrome um, and you know they develop like a peanut allergy, you have to think to yourself about um, EpiPen would be dangerous for them. And maybe we're going to do that and maybe we'll think, you know, but we just want to do it together as a team, thinking about what the pros and cons are. But you can't give them a Z pack because they could prolong their QT. This is a fantastic website. It's called qtdrugs.org, or you can Google it, it's Credible Meds. Um, and they update, um, I know the, the doctor who runs it, everybody in the world uses that website for the most accurate lists for long QT drugs. Okay, um, this one is where the family history was key. And I'm just sort of pointing out, like for each one of these, one piece of the history is crucial. So, you know, kind of have a checklist in our brain to make sure we uh, do that for everybody. So here's an eight-year-old boy who comes in because he's had syncope. Um, and his dad had syncope, but we hear that he has a defibrillator. And you know how that is, like, 
dad's not really there. We don't have all the records yet, but you know, there's like a big red flag over this child um, sitting in the office because of that. But we don't know why. Maybe he had a, a total uh, um, myocardial infarction. He has a defibrillator, or is it something genetic? We don't know. We're getting dad's EKG facts to us, but there is Asian heritage here, which actually is a huge risk factor for this one type of arrhythmia. I'll show you. So here's the boy's first EKG, and it's completely normal. Normal PR interval, no pre-excitation, QTC is normal, T waves are normal. Um, but because I knew the dad's heritage, and because he was a relatively young man to have had a cardiac arrest, and I didn't get any other history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or something like that, I did a second type of EKG looking for um, uh, something called Brugada syndrome. And uh, it usually affects young men in their 20s. Again, it's a sleep type of thing. It's that same sodium channel with a different effect. Baseline EKG can be completely normal. Um, and maybe it'll only be abnormal right after an event. This is what we're looking for, this kind of weird um, RSR prime, big ST segment changes in V1 and V3. But you can bring that out in somebody. So go back to this EKG. That's the boy's baseline EKG. I moved his V1 and V2 up one interspace, and now you can see he's got it. So he has an RSR prime with ST segment elevation. And we're not gonna actually do anything for him right this minute, but we know he's gonna need a defibrillator by the time he's 12 or 13 to pr protect him for when he would be an older adolescent. There isn't any medication for this. Exercise restriction doesn't really help because it's not really an exercise thing, although we don't like them to get hot something about being hypermetabolic that can bring out events. Um, but that was all just because I knew the family history. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done that extra EKG. Um, and here's one uh, that is the importance of getting accurate witness account of an event. Um, so sometimes we really have to, it's, you know, the parents don't know the history either, and the child can't quite give it all to us. But here's a girl who passed out at school. And um, EMS brought her in, and once she was in the ED, she remembers people saying she didn't have any pulse, but everybody thought that must not have been true if she remembered that. She didn't really need any shocks or anything, so it wasn't really clear what had happened, and she got admitted with a diagnosis of syncope. And here's her ECG, and it's completely normal. Um, the way I look at it, this is like if you're on a, in a little boat on Loch Ness, you know, and this looks fine, but like underneath it, like doo -doo, doo -doo, what's hiding under here, okay? This is completely normal. But she got admitted, she was having some PVCs, so we did an exercise test, and just to cut to the chase, um, this is after she's been exercising for about six minutes. She doesn't feel bad at all. She's talking to me. Everyone else in the room was feeling really bad <laughs> looking at this, but you can see how yucky this is. This is like, messy PVCs, and the worst part is they're going in different directions. And that might not be too obvious, but here's a PVC that's going that direction and the one next to it is going. So this is a very dangerous rhythm. This is polymorphic um, VT. Um, that's a normal EKG, so the screening EKG didn't help us there. It all is gonna get back to what really happened. So when I saw that, of course I stopped the exercise test. I went to the phone and I called her school nurse because I felt like there was more to this than um, we had heard. And in fact, um, the school nurse was fantastic and told me um, that um, she had worked as a cardiac nurse and a hospice nurse. And, um, and, and I said, so you, you know if there's a pulse or not. She said, yeah, I really do. I, and, I, and I said, well, so tell me what happened. She said, well, they screamed for me. I ran in the room um, and she looked like she, that was it. She was gone. I started doing CPR. I yelled at them to get the AED. They brought the AED to the room, and um, by the time they got there and put it on her, she was waking up, so her rhythm had normalized. And so the school nurse saved her life, and um, she, uh, we put an ICD in her and put her on a beta blocker, and um, a couple months later, she had an appropriate shock, meaning that um, it was good that she had that ICD in. But it all got back to um, this part, the history. So again, um, you know, we weren't going to let her go home without doing her workup, but she really had had CPR, not just syncope, and that was a huge piece of the pie. Um, I think this is the last one, and then we'll um, see if there's any new questions.
So this is a 14 year old boy who fell short of breath playing soccer. He'd been treated for asthma for about a year. Um, but this time he felt like something was in his throat and he passed out. So 911 was called. He was conscious, um, but he was having some respiratory distress and came to the ED. And he had a very bad looking EKG with um, ST segment elevations all over here and ST segment depressions all over here. So once you see that, you know you're in trouble. You know, he must be having some kind of bad ischemia. Does he have a thick heart and he has ischemia? Does he have an abnormal coronary and he has ischemia? Um, if we think back to our adult medicine uh, days, remember there's something about focality. So the fact that it's up in these leaves and down in those um, makes us worry about a coronary um, issue. Um, the piece with him is this was his first episode of syncope. Um, you know, he'd had respiratory distress and asthma for a while. And the reason this happens, um, I'll show you a picture of this. The reason this happens is that if you have a left coronary artery that comes off over by the right, where it should really come off over here, comes off by the right, it'll pass between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, if you can just imagine a cross section there. So as you get older and your competitive sports gets more demanding, and the great vessels dilate as you're exercising, they squish on it. And so this is what we're thinking of, you know, this is rare. I mean, maybe you, I probably only will see this three or four times in my life. So it's not like you want to um, think everybody has something horrible like this, but it's in the back of your mind. And that's why when you ask, was it chest pain and shortness of breath with exercise, that's what you're really thinking. Like, is it something that's either alpha tract obstruction or was it a coronary? And it, it probably won't be, but that, that's the reason for those questions. So um, just to wrap up, um, who requires more evaluation? Um, first of all, I would skip all the way to the bottom to anybody who worries you. you know, I so respect people. Um, I did primary care for a long time too, and I know how hard that is. If it doesn't make sense to you and you're just worried, that's, that's just as good as any other testing that we could possibly do in terms of who needs more workup. But if there's a family history of sudden death or any of those kinds of things, um, that's a red flag. Um, and it may not have anything to do with this patient, but that's somebody, you know, to think about. It could be have something inheritable. Um, certainly if there's um, syncope where somebody got injured, they had palpitations, they had chest pain, um, anybody with exercise, I think, syncope with exercise, especially that full out running, falling over type person, that worries me the most. Um, right after exercise, when you relax and your heart rate comes down, but you have a lot of adrenaline, that's when ventricular tachycardia can come out in some patients. Um, but it's also a time when something simple could still be happening. They still could have had a vasovagal event. It's just that once you mix those two symptoms together, I think we need a little more workup. Of course, if they've had heart surgery and things like that, then they need to get some follow-up. And if you think the cardiac exam is abnormal, or if you're screening EKG, um, if you've done one as abnormal, then for sure any of those. Um, with the backdrop that, you know, most of this is going to be common, uh, vasovagal or orthostatic syncope. And I think it's just that diligence of that invisible clipboard of making sure it doesn't sound like something else. And everything's important. History, I think, is key. And, of course, physical exam is key. Both of those are things that, you know, you do every day. And then some diagnostic tests are obviously going to be really helpful. Um, and if you don't get the history right for the event, we may get off on a wild goose chase. Um, and family history, too, sometimes takes quite a long time to get. Um, it's certainly if you think there's LV obstruction on exam. Um, and also, if you just don't feel like it really sounds perfectly vasovagal or orthostatic, then that might be a good patient to uh, do an ECG on. This way you won't miss things that are invisible like WPW or long QT that isn't going to have any physical findings. And I certainly want to be able to sort of glance at those EKGs and make sure it doesn't jump out at you as something. Um, and again, um, trust your instincts. So I'm happy to take any questions. Or if you want to email me later, my email is just egreen, E-G-R-E-E-N-E, -E, um, at salute.unm. Well, I, I do have one question yeah. um, to distinguish vasovagal syn syncope from something we should be more concerned about. On the at the very end, one of them was any syncope with injury, 
yeah. but also palpitation of chest yeah. pain. What I mean, how do you? Well, you know, I think that's the timing of it too, because if you got injured um, and then had syncope, that's pretty easily explained as a vasovagal type uh, from pain and fear. Um, if you uh, are totally unguarded, so that you went down so fast that you got injured, we always worry about that being maybe a rhythm issue, although a lot of times it doesn't turn out to be that. But if you um, protected yourself on the way down and, you know, maybe like sprained your hand or something, but didn't hurt your face, people really protect their face. And if they go down and really get a head injury or a face injury, um, I find most people send those folks. Okay. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So injury from having syncope versus yeah. getting an injury. Right. And having syncope. Yeah, having okay. had an injury before actually reassures me that that's a good, that, okay. that probably vasovagal, you know. Any other questions? And as you're thinking of those, also anybody who's uh, come on to the webinar um, since last time we did roll call at the beginning, uh, please let us know that you're out there. And especially if you're in a group, um, two or more people, just let us know that um, who all is there so everyone gets credit. Don't see any more questions. Hi, um, my name is Marissa Escobar, and I came in later. Hi, Melissa. Marissa, M-A-R-I-S-A, -S Marissa. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I think that's I think that's all the questions that we have for now and uh, definitely email us if you have any further yeah. and uh, um, we'll be doing it again uh, next month uh, we're looking for some input as far as what uh, we'd like to what everyone would like to hear about so uh, let us know uh, what any ideas you might have uh, for topics or speakers, and um, we will see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.